Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. How are you doing? Are you enjoying this amazing conference? Yes, that's great. It's wonderful to see such a great big turnout. It reminds me of my MTV days, especially the music before. Um, so uh, just a small correction. Of course, my book is called From MTV to Mecca, not from Mecca to MTV. Otherwise, I wouldn't be standing here now. But uh, <laughs> never mind. I can tell you one thing. If, uh, well, let's start in the name of God, the most compassionate, the most merciful. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. If someone had told me at the height of my MTV career in 92 that one day I would be a practicing Muslim and standing in front of all of you to tell my tale, I would have told them, I would have said to them, they must be absolutely mad because I was living a life very far from religion, let alone Islam. I was working in an environment, you know, that obviously was filled with lights, glamour, action, stars, all sorts of things, but not exactly spirituality. Um, but God works in mysterious ways and he knows what he's doing. So from a life of hedonism and materialism, I was guided to find contentment and inner peace by surrendering to God in Islam. Alhamdulillah. Bef <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Takbir. Before I reverted 15 years ago, you can say I had everything a normal Western teenager may dream of. You know, after my education as a radio journalist in Germany, I applied for a job advert uh, with MTV Europe and I got the job which meant I had to move to London, which is what I wanted to do because previously I was an exchange student in the US for one year and I thought I knew English, but um, I was struggling a little bit in London because of all the accents and everything. It took quite a while to get used to it. But anyway, I became the first German presenter on MTV and for over seven years interviewed rock stars for a living. Enjoyed red carpet treatment wherever we went with our little camera team. I went to a lot of VIP parties and often had two, three invites a night. I interviewed the Rolling Stones, went on the road with Prince, met Robbie Williams, and hung out with Elizabeth Hurley, all famous people during my heydays. I don't know if any one of you still knows these people, but they were, you were very, very famous, a bit like Lady Gaga and so on nowadays. Anyway, um, once I went on stage in front of not 8,000 people, but 70,000 people. There was a sea of people and everybody screaming and clapping and it felt like floating on a cloud of energy. But then when I went back to my hotel room with the noise still ringing in my ears, I felt lonely. And somehow I had to come down from this rush of energy, you know, and I, I, I often was quite unhappy and not really satisfied despite having everything you can say, you know, materially, externally, but something was missing and I did not know what it was. I thought perhaps it was a partner, a soulmate, but in retrospect, no human being could have filled that inner void, only the divine, and that was not part of my life at the time. Eventually, I experienced a deep crisis. I was rushing from one show to the next, always having to perform, always having to be perfect. And, you know, I didn't know why I was doing what I was doing. And on my way to Belgium to host yet another show, I was so low, I felt, I thought to myself, if the plane was to crash, I couldn't care less. And it was at this time of dissatisfaction that I was introduced to Islam, not by a long bearded Imam who perhaps rammed religious rulings down my throat, no, by a handsome sports star, uh, Imran Khan. And I don't know if you know Imran Khan here in America. He was the captain of a cricket team in Pakistan and he is now running for prime minister in, uh, also in Pakistan. Anyway, um, so he talked about philosophy and I always liked philosophy, you know, and he talked about Islamic philosophy. 
And in fact, just when I met him, he, they had just, he had just won the World Cup for Pakistan, which had completely passed me by because being German, I wasn't raised with cricket, so I had no idea who he was. Anyway, he challenged me about the ethical and moral, my ethical and moral values, you can say. He asked me, for example, what was the purpose of life? What is the purpose of our life? This is one question each and every one of us needs to ask themselves. Why are you here on this earth? What is your contribution going to be? You know, what is it all about? And I simply didn't have an answer. I hadn't thought about it at the time. So anyway, he asked me out. And uh, the first time I turned up uh, to go out with a few friends, I was wearing a mini dress. And uh, we were going out with a few Pakistanis and Indians. And he asked me if I wouldn't mind keeping on my coat all evening. Because in his culture, women and men don't show flesh. So OK, I did that. And um, you know, it was a little bit odd. But uh, then when I started thinking about it, it actually made sense. Why should a woman you know, with her skin, showing her skin, get places in life, even in, in business. Nowadays, I'm always surprised why women often show cleavage and mini wear mini, mini dresses, whereas men always wear suits. I mean, how degrading it is for a woman having to always show her assets. You know, uh, in advertisements, uh, women advertising half naked any kind of product from perfume to cigarettes to car tires or whatever it is. Um, that actually is degrading. So. When I started thinking about it, that was actually one of the first things I sort of understood and began to change in my own life while I was still interviewing rock stars on MTV. My skirts became longer and cleavage higher. Um, anyway, um, so what touched me actually most about Imran wasn't his famous friends, but it was how he was going to build, he was actually in the process of building a cancer hospital where the poor people would be treated for free in Lahore because they didn't have any cancer hospitals at all. And he said to me, believe in God and do good deeds. Just like our previous speaker was saying, that is the essence of being a Muslim. And I quite liked that. He talked, Imran also talked a lot about spirituality. The fact that we are made of mind, body, and soul. And our soul needs nourishment like the body. And I, until then, I hadn't even noticed I had a soul. And probably one of the effects of this neglect was my crisis, despite having had everything, you know. And I mean, during those times, in my dark moments, there was only one remedy, retail therapy, going shopping. But you very soon realize having a new handbag or a new pair of shoes only gives you joy temporarily. Then you still want more. In fact, it's something very insatiable that cannot be quenched except for the insatiable himself, the, the, the everlasting, omnipotent God Almighty. You don't otherwise ever get satisfaction. So actually, my discussions with Imran were a little bit of a wake-up call for me. He gave me a lot of books to read. Well, in fact, the fir very first book he gave me, Man in Islam, really resonated deeply in me. I, to my great surprise, the doctrines made sense. Um, the idea that there was one God, the creator and destiny of the universe, absolutely powerful, infinitely good, compassionate, ever forgiving, God is greater than, than anything in the world, yet closer to us than our own jugular vein. I mean, that really resonated with me. I liked the idea of worshiping nothing but this one God, neither fame, nor contacts, nor fortune, nor anything but God. I was also astonished about the commonalities between is Islam and Christianity. I liked the concept of self-responsibility, that we are responsible for our own actions. Not someone 2,000 years ago has somehow already taken away our sins. The idea that there is divine justice um, and that God always spoke the same message just through different prophets. 
and that Prophet Muhammad was the last prophet who tied up all the loose ends, Islam being the final religion. So then very soon, so I liked what I read basically. Very soon Imran invited me to travel to Pakistan. Not exactly a tourist destination, but certainly worth the adventure, I thought, not realizing the monumental consequences this trip would have on me. So we trekked through awe-inspiring, beautiful, magnificent mountains, um, the Karakurum and, um, and the Himalayas, where simple people made a greater impression on me with their warmth, their generosity, and most of, m most of all, their faith than anybody I'd met in show business before. And for the first time, I discovered how much fun you can have without drinking alcohol. It was a bit of a revelation. And um, anyway, as we climbed higher up the mountains, we came, we went past very, very poor people who were living on top of the animals. The cows function as a natural heating systems. They didn't have any material comforts at all, but they were very rich in faith. And as we walked through the villages with a bismillah in the name of God, like everything a Muslim does, they offered me whatever they had, dried walnuts, apricots, so and so. And I just thought to myself, how come they seem so content and they had these radiant eyes? You know, what gave them their contentment despite their adverse situation, uh, despite their poverty, material poverty? But uh, so, you know, I was, I was very moved by the dignity and their generosity because of course they invited us and shared whatever they had. Wherever we went with Imran's Jeep, he was surrounded by a, a crowd of people. Everybody wanted an autograph, photographs taken, or so, some very poor people pressed a few rupees into his hands. This is for the hospital, you know? And he used to say, it's the poor people who build the hospital, not the rich. He was very impressed by the, his fellow countrymen being so ready to help. And in fact, everybody wanted to be part of it. I witnessed this. Women took off their jewelry to, be, to help this hospital. And now, even until now, poor people are being treated for free. And uh, they built a, they're building a second hospital, I believe, I think in Peshawar. And uh, it's really, it's a huge success. And you know, it was this friendship and faith, the support of the people for whatever, when I feel it now, you know, for no other reason except for attaining God's pleasure. This is something that is very, very touching when you become a Muslim. So since my introduction to Eastern culture, something grew inside of me and I really couldn't stop it. Um, you know, uh, through my frequent travels to Pakistan, I started questioning my own life, the superficiality of show business, the obsession with youth, how people would go under the knife in order to, and have Botox and all these kind of injections in order to sort of attain eternal youth. But of course, that's not possible. The only everlasting thing is the soul. So of course it makes sense to try and, and purify and, and, and work on bettering the soul, not just the outside. God does not judge you according to your bodies and appearances, but he looks into your hearts and observes your actions says a hadith of the prophet, peace be upon him. So I soon became aware of my inner voice, this conscience, you know, when you do something right or do something wrong. And of course, there's the beautiful Quranic verse, God shows you his signs on the horizons and within yourselves. So I realized studying Islam really helped me and it still does with my daily life. You know, when I felt stressed out and under pressure, the verse in the Quran, um, that God does not burden any soul with more than he can bear, always encouraged me, you can do it, you know. Um, or the idea that God rewards our efforts and our intentions gives a very relaxing feeling. As long as you know you've done your best, you leave the rest in the hands of God. The outcome is in God's hands of everything we do. So after three years of researching and my friendship with Imran actually had finished, um, I realized Islam is not an academic exercise. If I wanted to taste the spiritual fruits and feel, um, feel the religion, feel the spiritual fruits, there was only one way. Get down on your prayer mat and start practicing. So 
Since then, I must say that inner void is filled with meaning and prayers, dhikr, reading about Islam, God, how to better your character is my internal inspiration, alhamdulillah. Of course, a transformation like this, becoming Muslim, you know, journey from MTV to Mecca, does not happen overnight and it really is a process that takes time. And anybody who wants to take up Islam, I can only recommend, take your time. You know, you don't have to become an angel overnight. Um, my first attempt at Ramadan was a complete disaster. I went out clubbing the night before, was in bed next day with a pounding headache. I had a bit too much of champagne and gave up Ramadan fasting uh, at lunch. This was when Ramadan was in the winter. I'm ashamed to admit. May God forgive me my bad beginnings. Since then, I gave up alcohol and fly, I'm flying through every Ramadan, alhamdulillah. Even now, 18 hours fasting in uh, England. But God's grace. And with this, thank you. I mean, you know, you've been doing it for even longer. But with this, I've discovered a very important secret of Islam. And that is, if you go one step towards God, God comes 10 steps towards you. If you walk towards God, he comes running to you. But the secret is that we must take the first step. And this, of course, is a hadith of the Prophet, peace be upon him. Now, when I embraced Islam, it was a um, total disaster for my career. From being an award-winning TV presenter with seven years of positive press, I was suddenly hounded in the press. Has she lost the plot? Is she supporting terrorism? You know, and within a few matter of a few weeks, I was sacked from my youth show despite having had a freshly signed new contract and for no reason really. And then MTV also finished during my, that year. And I realized, you know, through my friends and, friends and faith, my newfound friends and faith, I realized a lot of things. And that is, for example, to see the world from a spiritual perspective, to understand what is happening from a higher perspective. And I learned that suffering can be good for you. It's a form of purification. It's a test, an elevation. And um, Rumi, for example, he likens suffering with chickpeas that are cooked in boiling water until they're sweet, soft, and delicious. And I love this hadith that says how wonderful the situation of a believer is. For all his affairs are good. If something good happens to him, he gives thanks for it, and that is good for him. If something bad happens, he bears it with patience, and that is good for him. And this does not apply to anyone but a believer. So seen from this perspective, the whole of life, no matter what happens, is a win-win scenario. And so basically, um, you know, all these years later, I came back with my book, From MTV to Mecca, I wrote it in order to lift the veils of uh, the best kept secret in the West, and that is Islam. People don't really know what it's all about, and that is you know, what I realized in 95 when I experienced all this Islamophobia, and they still don't know about it. So really, we need to tell people about Islam. We need to befriend non-Muslims and, um, and, you know, extend our friendship towards them and be patient when they ask stupid questions. Just remember, they only watch the media. They see ISIS all the time beheading people, killing innocent aid workers and journalists. Of course, they think Islam is bad, but they need to understand that that has nothing to do with Islam, that in fact is against the teachings of Islam. So it's up to us. We are all ambassadors of Islam, whether you're being appointed or not, no matter, whether you like it or not, we are all ambassadors of Islam. So um, I'd like to um, finish now with um, a, a quote from, well, a little poem from Bully Shah, uh, who lived in the 18th century in the subcontinent because I really, I found my faith via Pakistan, and this is a Pakistani poet, and it expresses my spiritual quest at the time. You read so many books to know it all, yet you fail to read your heart at all. You rush to holy shrines to play a part. Would you dare enter the shrine of your heart? You're quick to attack the evil one, yet pride is a battle you have not won. You grab for a star you can control, yet fail to grasp the light in your soul. 
I pray that we all find ways and means to grasp the light in our souls and disseminate it into the world. Thank you very much, and inshallah. <laughs> Thank you.